and hello and good afternoon everyone almost exactly on the st stroke of 12 noon p.m. Uh, we're getting started today my name is uh, Grant Smith Ellis and I'm the president of MassCan uh, welcome today for what is the 22nd uh, MassCan virtual uh, Ed Village panel uh, I'm going to introduce my guest in one second but before I do that uh, MassCan, the Massachusetts Cannabis Reform Coalition, is a registered 501c4 nonprofit that has been lobbying uh, and uh, advocating for the reform of cannabis laws since 1989. You can find more information about MassCan at masscan.org or follow the organization on any of our social media uh, Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram, at masscan.org. Uh, so thank you very much to MassCan for facilitating not only the virtual Ed Village, uh, but also a large amount of events related to grassroots activism in the Commonwealth. I'm grateful to be a part of the organization, and it's well worth checking out. Um, but enough about MassCan. Let's get to uh, our guest, because this is an educational interview. And I could say a lot about my guest. I've been uh, conversing with him in the digital space for a long time in relation to the cannabis arena, uh, not only in regards to uh, the implementation of adult use laws around the country, but also how large corporate forces attempt to influence that implementation. But before we get into that, Brian Box Brown, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourself, as I think a lot of folks uh, who are familiar with MassCan will just be getting to know you. Hi, yeah, so um, I'm a comic artist. I've been working, making comics for about 15 years. Um, <clears throat> I have been making mostly in the last bunch of years nonfiction comics. I did a biography of Andre the Giant called Andre the Giant Life and Legend that was my first book. It ended up being a New York Times bestseller. Um, which was huge. I don't think I've had a book sell as many <laughs> since it came out. But um, and since then, I've been making. I, I've done. Uh, I think I have like four or five nonfiction books that have come out. Um, uh, Andy Kauf, one about Andy Kaufman, one about the the video game Tetris, and I did a book about uh, a plant that you and I hold dear called cannabis, uh, and it was. I did a book called Cannabis, the, the Illegalization of Weed in America. And it was um, basically a history about how we got to the stage. You know, a lot of people, we're all talking about legalization now, but the book covers a lot of the stuff, how we got to prohibition in the first place. Um, and uh, it was an interesting, um, uh, interesting journey working on that book i mean i was pretty you know I, I got arrested for smoking cannabis when i was 16. um wasn't you know a huge deal for me a white kid from a fairly wealthy suburb um you know i didn't i, I mean i had to go to prohibition um probation uh every week and, and get p tested and stuff but you know they treated me pretty well i got to see how how uh, people who weren't white got treated uh, by the same probation officer, and you know, it was an enlightening experience. I was, I wonder if I would be a cannabis activist today if I didn't get arrested when I was 16. I think it like served the opposite purpose of what they were doing, which was to try to pr try to keep me from being interested in cannabis and dissuade me, but it it only fueled it because. It didn't make any sense to me. I was like, well, uh, how come if you get a, a cop to come and bust an underage, par a party where everybody's underage drinking, and they like, all they do is like call, you know, call the parents to come pick them up. But if there's cannabis there, everybody gets thrown in handcuffs. And it just didn't make sense to me. Um, and, I, you know, I think at some point I was like, well, I didn't know the history at first, you know, I was, I figured, I think that, um, people used to think that cannabis was dangerous because they didn't really know as much as we know now, but now that we know it's not dangerous, you know, but really, I think when I was doing the research, that wasn't what happened. What happened was they knew it wasn't dangerous then and they used, they used it to oppress a minority population, an immigrant population. Uh, and just the, work, the working class in general. Um, 
you know, it, it was just used as a way to control people, and it still is. Uh, so, like, after learning that kind of history, and then being a cannabis, a medical cannabis patient in Pennsylvania, um, and the, I think that really, you know, is what really radicalized me was being a patient <laughs> in this extremely restrictive environment where you actually can't get a quality product and the stuff that is available is really expensive and, and not really good. Um, and uh, so I was like, why is this happening? You know, that why is it like this? This isn't what I envisioned uh, legalization to be. You know, I don't think, I think when people think about it, think about what legalization is, they just say, think, you know, oh, well, there's prohibition and then they get rid of prohibition and then it's legal. But that's not really exactly how things have happened. You know, um, it ends up, my wife calls it, because I talk about, she's probably so annoyed and bored of cannabis talk at this point, but she says, she said, it sounds like trickle down legalization. And she's right because what happens is you know there's a trajectory i think that states are following especially on the east coast i mean it's hard to say who the first one was my friend chris goldstein says it was new jersey was like the first state to do it this way where they he might be right i'm not i'm not totally sure where it was like this they legalized medical cannabis but it was this extremely restrictive version of medical cannabis unlike say in in california when they when they legalized it wasn't when they originally legalized in 96 it was very broad it was a very broad legalization where you know they were able to have uh cannabis grow collectives right away right off the bat you know um and, and home grow and all these things like uh were just a given and now what new jersey did and other states like them, because they've really commodified every aspect of this, of, of legalization, so that it really, the biggest benefits go to a very small group of people, and the goals of those, of those companies aren't to produce the highest quality medicine at the most competitive price. They are to corner off as much of the market away from uh, small business and working class people and anyone else really except for the small group and then once they have that charge them the, as much money as the market could possibly stand um, for inferior and, quality product which to bring it back you were saying as a patient that radicalized you because you recognized that as a patient, you couldn't get access to anything but low quality, high cost cannabis because there was an artificial uh, oligopoly basically in the market. Yeah, yeah, and I, I don't think people pick up on that right away because especially if you're not well versed in cannabis, I think when people talk about low quality medicine, when you hear somebody who is like a cannabis patient and talking about low quality medicine, I think people, it conjures up this idea in someone's mind of like snobbery or just like this isn't the good shit you gotta get but you know what i'm saying but that's not really the case because you can actually quantify what high and low quality medicine are including especially impurities when, right yes yes and, and and especially i think in terms of um when you talk about the extracts and oils which is a huge portion of the market like that's what they really want is these oils and stuff because they have longer shelf life you know they're they're uh make more money you know you're selling one gram of concentrate for first companies in pa selling them for 106 dollars a gram things wow. like that yeah um and you know i i, I just i don't it's hard to describe to people and i, I try to describe it to uh the people from California. I was like talking to a to a grower in California who you know makes really great products. I was like, I respect the way, how this guy does this stuff, and I was telling him about PA, and he's like, just 
you know, don't worry, man. Eventually, it's all going to get settled out, and quality is going to be what sells. And, you know, and he's right, but we're in a situation, I think, where the corporations ruling this can delay what he's talking about for very long. I mean, it's, it's, we're seeing like in, in, in Massachusetts and Illinois, there's, they've been, there's, you know, been legalization for a few years now, and there's still a lot of delays that are keeping the market, uh, you know, basically cornered by these companies. Well, well, it goes back to your initial point, and I think it's a theme you know, over the past few years, a lot of drug reform organizations, whether it's MassCan on the local level, normal or otherwise, have gone through this crisis of conscience in the face of legalization. But in reality, what they're facing now, and I think if anything, this has reinvigorated the grassroots movement, is a recognition that prohibition doesn't end at legalization because implementation vis-a-vis -vis regulatory frameworks and otherwise is just as important. And to bring up that point, I think Massachusetts, and, and I wanna talk about all these states, but Massachusetts is a fascinating microcosm of both what sort of bad regulations can look like and what good regulations can look like. And here's why I say that. Yeah. And uh, I'm sure you followed it closely as well. So originally when Massachusetts legalized, um, there was medical cannabis in 2012 adult use marijuana cannabis in 2016. When the adult use was legalized, guess who the largest forces fighting against uh, the legalization of adult use in the Commonwealth were? I'm sure you can imagine existing medical dispensaries and this group of anti-cannabis politicians, uh, and this uh, will come back later, the group was called the Campaign for a Safe and Healthy Massachusetts. It was run by Governor Charlie Baker, Boston mayor at the time, uh, Marty Walsh, uh, a state representative named Hannah Kane, and a few other folks. So that was, legalization happens anyway, and what do the medical companies do? When the legalization law gets updated by the legislature in the summer of 2017 before it's implemented, they get themselves a special priority in the law on par with or above applicants from communities that were disproportionately harmed by the drug war. Now, what happens as a result of that is the Cannabis Control Commission in Massachusetts, when they go to implement their regulations, they realize, wow, these medical dispensaries tried to make it so that like the 12 operational dispensaries, medical dispensaries could take over the entire market. What can we do? And what they realized was they were gonna have to try to set up some program to create an equity structure. What didn't work though, was just creating the economic empowerment and the social equity program and trying to do a one-to-one -one rollout of equity to non-equity applicant. It didn't work because there was not enough financing, uh, investment capital for equity applicants. And because the, as you said, the process, the local level process, the uh, state level process is difficult for smaller companies. Now the point of all this is what I'm coming to next. Where Massachusetts turned a corner was the delivery operator license. And what I mean by that is last summer, the Cannabis Control Commission was thinking about how to implement its delivery regulations. And they were thinking about in this context of, wow, our equity program has only resulted in four to seven uh, EEs and SEs opening. We haven't done enough. We can't get lenders because the Safe Banking Act isn't passed yet. What can we do for these companies? They created an entire license class just for equity applicants. But the issue was retailers, and this is a perfect example of the corporate influence over the lawmaking process, brick and mortar retailers in Massachusetts wanted it so that delivery companies could only be Uber Eats drivers, where they would basically, delivery companies could own cars, but then they would have to pick up orders at retail price from brick and mortar retailers and make their money on the delivery fee. Mm -hmm. So these equity companies and a bunch of other advocates come in and say, hey, we should be able to have a warehouse, have a vault, buy product at wholesale from cultivators and manufacturers and co-ops and micro businesses, and then sell it directly without having a storefront and then do our delivery. And the commission said, sure, you can have that. What did those brick and mortar retailers do in January of 2021? They tried to sue. They tried to sue and say there should be no equity priority period for three years for these delivery licenses and that that delivery operator license shouldn't even exist. Now that lawsuit got withdrawn after a boycott, but the point, and what I'd like to ask you is, 
Yes, some states have turned a corner, but in the states that haven't turned a corner, is it because people aren't paying attention to how these dispensaries and existing operators are operating in the legal and regulatory sphere? I mean, I think they're, they're trying to make it ever more complicated, so, so it is more obtuse and harder to understand what's even happening and how they're manipulating the market. Um, you know, the thing that happened uh, in Massachusetts, that, that just part of it makes me think if there's not enough financing for all these small businesses, maybe the cost of operation is too high. Maybe the cost of licensing is too high. Maybe the cost of real estate is too fucking high. Excuse me. Um, so like there's part, part of me thinks about that is that, you know, you can put in all these things to help, you know, if your license, if your license is $200,000, let's say, there could be a lot of things in place to, get, to help small businesses get that $200,000 or you can make that license $5,000. And then all these small businesses here don't have to get private finance, don't have to get different financing. They can finance it themselves or among they can fundraise themselves. So I think about that and I think about how a lot of times when we, when what's happening is that we're all, I think people are in agreement that we want equity, right? I mean, among the public and among activists and among the, you know, companies, politicians, they all talk about equity. It's like a big thing and it, it's super important. But I think there's bigger, there, galaxy braining themselves into what equity looks like. And really, equity is fairly simple. Everyone's allowed to grow it and possess it. It's easy to become to, to become a business and become a legal business. Almost as easy as it is to become an illegal business. That type of access is what I think equity really is. But equity has to be more than that, right? It has to take into consideration the disproportionate impact that the drug war caused in specific communities, right? I mean, it has to include right. that. I agree. I agree. But I also think about how, what role did cannabis play in that drug war situation? Who are the victims of the cannabis sellers and what did they do? And I think a lot of the victims are the, just the people that were selling the cannabis. The people that were getting the cannabis were being helped by those people. You know what I'm saying? Well, I so, think about the Halderman, um, I mean, I'm sure you're familiar with this um, time period, but I think about Halderman um, and Ehrlichman and Nixon in the 70s mm -hmm. saying basically, listen, we want to target two distinct groups of people black and yeah. brown communities and anti-war protesters. And they right. said, black and brown communities disproportionately use cannabis. If we create the Controlled Substances Act of 1972, it'll give us the tools to target them and stop their political activism. And I, I don't think, of course, that amounts to every ever cannabis arrest, but I think it speaks to how police oh, departments definitely. set up the structure. Ronnie, let me just say, I absolutely agree. And I think that like black and brown people that aren't, that don't use cannabis, that never touch the stuff are affected by the drug war every God, every day because they're the, they get pulled over, they get their car searched because they smell cannabis, whatever. It's just like a reason to search people. And that is what happens. So that, there has, that does have to be addressed. But I, but, and listen, this is, I think, part of uh, what I've learned about politics 101. Every time you try to do something good, it gets kind of bastardized and pushed and, and redefined to become something that's nefarious. Mm -hmm. So what we're seeing, like, in Connecticut, they're saying instead of, now, instead of, allowing anyone with a cannabis conviction to have special access to a, a cannabis license, they're taking money and giving it to 
townships that have been disproportionately harmed by the drug war. So, so when I see stuff like that, I'm, I see it as nefarious because now, why, why are we saying one instead of the other? Right, wait, so, it's, so let me understand, because I, I obviously followed the Connecticut situation, and for folks who are just learning about this, Connecticut just mm -hmm. legalized adult use cannabis last mm -hmm. week. Uh, folks like Cure CT, Jason Ortiz, Jason, Joseph yeah, Raymond, yeah. so many others mm -hmm. did excellent work to get that bill passed. Now you're talking about um, what qualifies someone to be um, a social equity applicant, but you're also talking mm -hmm. about, and I want to get back to something, uh, social equity loan fund. I want to get your thoughts on that in a second. Mm -hmm. But before we get there, you're talking here about in Connecticut, what qualified someone to be a social equity applicant. And then you're also talking about how the cannabis excise tax that Connecticut collects is going to be spent. So are you saying right. that, that they took away the ability for someone to qualify to be a social equity applicant based on a cannabis arrest? Is that what, is that what happened? That's what, that's, uh, so when they were about, to, the bill had this uh, provision in it for a cannabis arrest and uh, the governor wouldn't sign it unless they changed that provision because he thought it would give, give people too much access to the market. And uh, he said that it, it, they are addressing equity. They don't have to do this because they're addressing equity by sending money to these townships. And so it's, it's just like gobbledygook in a way. I mean, one, they're just totally disconnected, two disconnected methods. And two, like you can't, anytime you're taking away access, it's bad. We want broad access. Now there is the still an are, equity program, right? I want to understand. There that. is. But it's just there that is. it's now harder to qualify for. Yes, yes. Um, you know, I mean, if you're arrested for cannabis, like, that's, that's guaranteed. You know what I'm saying? I don't know. Also, the people that have been arrested for cannabis are the subject matter experts. You know what I'm saying? They are the people who these companies like Cure Leaf and whomever, if they actually wanted to compete and, and create a product that people wanted, they would need these people. To, to be in the market because they actually need subject matter experts to create a quality product. And this is what, this is what, I, when I talk to my friends in Canada, this is what they talk about now, because in Canada, it's a true free market situation for everyone. Um, pretty, you know, I'm sure it has its issues, but for the most part, you can get involved in the business and they're actually competing on price and quality. Uh, which we're not seeing in a lot of other places. Now, until we get something like the Safe Banking Act, and for folks who are just learning about that, the Safe Banking Act mm. would allow interstate banks. So right now, banks can't lend to cannabis companies if they're regulated by the federal government. In short, it involves something called FDIC insurance, and it's far too complex to get into now. If the Safe Banking Act passes on a federal level, that would change. There would be more access to capital lending resources for cannabis companies, especially owned by equity operators, to get access to capital to get through the licensing process. Now, to, for folks to understand, to open a cannabis business in Massachusetts, for example, for a retail store, one to two million dollars. The record, the lowest I've ever heard it getting op one open for, and the person did all the lawyer uh, stuff themselves, all the consultant stuff, all the regulatory compliance stuff, 350,000. A cultivation operation to get it open in Massachusetts, indoor, you're looking at about 5 million. So what some folks have proposed in the state of Massachusetts is using 10 to 25% of the excise tax, there's a 20% excise tax on each cannabis sale in the state, goes into a general fund uh, for the legislature to fund social equity and economic empowerment applicants. It would be run by our state's housing and economic development authority, which already provides similar grants, no interest loans to other businesses, and it would have a provision for loan forgiveness and things of that nature. What do you think about the idea of using cannabis excise tax to fund smaller operators to get them into the market, create more competition, and basically do what we were talking about earlier? I think there's way easier ways to get small businesses into the market. One, let's reduce their startup costs by reducing the cost of licenses 
Or well, oh, okay, so I gotta, I gotta push you on this here because I think the, there's some nuance. So in Massachusetts, um, equity applicants get 100% uh, uh, of their licensing fees waived for most oh, license okay. types, yeah. And the, the most they pay for a license application is five to $10,000. The cost comes because okay. the process- Real estate? Uh, yes, the process is bifurcated. So mm -hmm. applicants must first get a local level permit and um, then they can go to the state level. But to get that local level permit and host community agreement, they need to rent a building and go through a 12 to 18 month process. And this is another thing I wanna to talk to you about. In Massachusetts, our equity status, our economic empowerment, social equity status, applies only once you get to the state level queue. There is no requirement on cities and towns when they're licensing these companies, which is the first hurdle, to take equity into consideration at all. So I'm interested in your thoughts on not only that sort of bifurcated structure, but also if the reality is that that states want to defer to local cities and towns, there's going to be a delay and they have to rent a property while they're doing it, what can we do? Get rid of the requirement, let people just get licensed and then find a property. Like, come on, like get people, you, can, you get the license, you can only sell so much cannabis you know what I'm saying? Like, well, you want to hear, know, you want to hear something very creative. And Shalene Title, um, who I know that you uh, see on Twitter, mm -hmm. uh, she uh, came up with this in Massachusetts. The Cannabis Control Commission passed it. They created a pre-certification program. So I told you a little bit about the bifurcated structure. They added this uh -huh. third element where the Cannabis Control Commission for delivery applicants, uh, uh, delivery operators, and couriers, uh, they can get pre-certified. When they get the pre-certification, they can go to the host city or town and say, hey, the Cannabis Control Commission's already pre-certified us, we, we are good to go. And it's supposed to encourage the city or town to get this done quicker. I mean, you know, I think this is the biggest problem maybe in Massachusetts is giving, I mean, and it's all over. And I think it's, I think, you know, you know, it's not just Massachusetts where you, the, the townships have so much control. You know, in New Jersey, they have uh, an opt out. You can opt out of cannabis businesses entirely, and and they, and the law actually incentivizes towns to opt out because you can opt out and opt back in at any time. But if you don't opt out, then you can't opt out for like five years or something like that. So, like, the township. When I think of a township not wanting a cannabis business in their town, I see it as discrimination, really. I mean, listen, this is a stigma that you don't want a cannabis business in your town. You know, there's towns in New Jersey, there's a town in New Jersey called Tom's River, New Jersey, and it's basically one long commercial dra drag that has vape shops, it has smoke shops, head shops, liquor stores the whole thing is, a, is one strip from the garden state parkway to the beach everybody there is stopping to buy stuff for their vacation perfect spot for a cannabis business mayor of tom's river says no way also there's towns in new jersey that have already said that they're okay with an mso operate woodbridge new jersey there's an MSO already operating, they're okay. But no new businesses allowed. So, I mean, this is just straight discrimination against cannabis users, um, patients, anybody. Um, there's no reason. Show me, we're talking about, we're in agreement here that this is a safe, therapeutic, easy to grow natural resource. It is not dangerous. It is not radioactive. There's nothing, there's nothing that needs to be, uh, have 24 hour security. I mean, it's all, it's just, you, these, these towns actually, you know, saying not in my backyard to cannabis are increasing the stigma. Shouldn't so they be I stripped that, of their tax revenue if they don't, if they ban the business? I've always felt I, that. I, of any, of, of any cannabis, of any yeah. share of the cannabis. I don't see why not because you know, a town, I mean, listen, I guess towns can do, you know, people that live where they live can do what they want, but I, I think that it's all stigma-based. Um, 
And if the state is saying that this is not a dangerous thing, also, like, look what happened in Massachusetts. I mean, there was a extortion case, and you covered it extensively. You know, and that involved wasn't did that not involve this township? Well, um, yes. Situation? So um, we were just talking a, a little bit earlier um, about the um, bifurcated process in Massachusetts. And as part of <clears throat> that local level process, there is indeed this very um, sort of um, opaque process where local city councils, mayors, uh, in some cases, town administrators <laughs> engage in behind the scenes negotiations for things called host community agreements or letters of non-opposition. You're talking about a case, uh, the fall mayor, former mayor of Fall River, J Jaisal Correa, the 23-year-old uh, was the youngest mayor ever elected uh, in, I think, Fall River, perhaps in Massachusetts. And he uh, was uh, accused and then convicted on, on 21 of 24 counts of basically saying to cannabis businesses through intermediaries, hey, if you want that letter of non-opposition that you need before you can get a host community agreement, you need to pay me $100,000. And that's and so, that's what the reality of some of these small towns, even big towns. Yeah. No, and I think that that's just somebody who is brazen enough to get caught. Uh, you know, um, this type of stuff is all over. I mean, it's not, it's not even just in cannabis. I mean, this is it's all it's all about me, you know. And and so giving these townships um, uh, that kind of power over cannabis businesses is directly in the face of equity because big cannabis can can pay these bribes all day long hundred thousand dollars for for cure relief that's nothing that's nothing for cure relief um and you know they can do that all day long and so we're now we'll never have an equitable market um it, it, when when townships run the show the other thing that when townships are pushing cannabis businesses out what it does is it shrinks the amount of available real estate that you can grow and produce cannabis in, which jacks up the prices for small businesses and for equity applicants and, and whomever. Um, and and the, the thing also that I think gets lost on everybody is that it's, it's really big business cannot, or at least decided not to, provide quality medicine and small cannabis does provide quality medicine small and local i was talking to a, a processor recently about um in, in a cannabis solventless concentrate world there's something called full milk and it's or six star six star hash um it's basically um just THC that's been, you know, um, and, 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 and uh, resin that's been collected from a dry sift usually, um, and, and stripped of everything but the good stuff, right? Now, this stuff I've always heard is like the best, the greatest, greatest, most flavorful thing. And then I, so I got some and I used it and I was like, you know, it's actually not that great. It, 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 it made my banger all messy and it, you know, it didn't smell all that great, all this stuff. I was talking to a producer and he's like, yeah, you can't get six star, six star to live, you know, ship or, or on the black market when it's expired and stuff like that. It's like, it would be like shipping sushi through the mail. It has to be fresh. It has to be, you know what I'm saying? So like, that's actually what's considered the highest quality concentrate on the market. And it cannot be produced by a big distributor shipping all over the country. It has to be made locally. It's like when you go uh, when when you go out to a restaurant and the difference in quality between a, a restaurant quality meal and catering. They're both the same meal, but in catering you're creating hundreds of meals. They can't. Po it couldn't possibly be as good as one created just for you. You know. So it, it's just a fact that it can't be, it can't really be done the same way by big corporations or big operations. 
industrial sized operations. They really don't produce the highest quality medicine. And when we're talking about medicine, you need access to the highest possible quality. Well, they, so, they also have an incentive to use those extensive political, financial, and other resources to obfuscate test results, to manipulate the process, and then when they get fined, say, oh yeah, it's 275000 You know, that's just a bad yeah. hour in Vegas for our CEO. Yeah, I, that's true. I mean, and, and until I think, you know, I think it just takes a lot of, a lot, it's going to be just a lot of, uh, I was talking to a, uh, an activist, Derek Shirley, uh, in Maine today, and he was just talking about how it, you know, it really requires everyone to get together. And there's a certain, I, I know if you, you, I'm sure you know, hang out in any cannabis circle long enough and you'll find out that politically speaking, cannabis is all over the spectrum. It's everybody. I mean, it's, every, you know, People think maybe cannabis is just like lefty, liberal, hippies or something. It's not. It is a space that is a broad, broad political spectrum. And so you have to, to really make your voice heard, you have to focus on where, you're, where, where you agree. And when you agree that you want, you want to reduce stigma, you want competitive pricing, you want small business, uh, and uh, working class minority equity businesses home grow. having a sh home grow, having a, all of these things, we can all get behind those things. You know what I'm saying? Like that's all, that's all going to, that's all going to benefit the consumer. The consumer is massively benefited by equity programs that will help small business get started. It is a massive benefit to the patient community to have to help small businesses get up and running because that's where the quality is going to come from but, and that's where the pr pricing is going to come down things but, like that but what about the astroturf which is so prevalent in almost every cannabis community throughout the country for example um, before we even get into the AstroTurf, I wanted to hit on something you talked about earlier, which is there's this incentive for existing cannabis operators to not only create an oligopoly, but to in some cases work with cannabis opponents to try to reduce and slow down the rollout. In Massachusetts, we had one group of companies, the Commonwealth Dispensary Association, they not only did that lawsuit against the equity delivery, they worked with anti-cannabis lawmaker Hannah Kane, who I brought up earlier, the campaign for a safe and healthy Massachusetts, to propose a task force bill that would bring police together with tax officials to target the unregulated market. What does it say when the corporate operators who are you know, functioning in this space, making money every day while people are still locked up for cannabis, are going to policymakers and saying, hey, the first thing you need to do is start locking more people up so we can make more money. What, what is that, how does that make you feel? It's horrible. I mean, <laughs> you know, we're seeing the same things in Delaware. Um, um, Columbia Care, who I believe is called Patriot Care. In Mass. In Massachusetts. Yeah. yeah. So they are on record. You can watch the testimony or listen to it. Uh, you can watch it, but there's, it's just their voice. And they're talking about how they're, they're, they're giving testimony against legalization now at this point because if they feel that this type of legalization wouldn't benefit them enough. Because and they what? They, they wouldn't get a first mover advantage over equity companies? Yes. That's disgusting. Yes. Absolutely. And the, my. Some of my favorite parts, it's actually, if you, if it was like a, a, a Saturday Night Live bit or something, it would be funny because one of the things that they, they say in their testimony is that we don't want to see Delaware end up like uh, Oregon. And as a patient and as a consumer and somebody who lives only 20 minutes from Delaware, I desperately would like Delaware to look like Oregon because it has the most access for anyone that has the highest quality product at the lowest quality, lowest prices, um, tons of competition. So, you know what I'm saying? It has like everything a functioning market would want and they're highlighting it, it as a bad thing. And, 
it just is, is mind-blowingly. Well, well it, highla it highlights the fundamental hypocrisy of sort of, I don't even know, I wouldn't call it neoconservative fiscal ideology. I would call it a very unique brand of a M American robber baron ideology, which obviously comes out of the what uh, J.D. Rockefeller did with the centralization of Standard Oil and then the way he influenced the railroads to give him half price rates for a certain amount of time so he could shut down all the independent producers, then pay kickbacks once all they were all out of business. So this is a fundamentally American problem and it's reared its head time and time again. And actually, if you think back to the distinction between Jefferson and Hamilton, this is the fundamental question of the American Republic. It rears its head in every emerging industry we've ever had. The difference in the cannabis arena is, and I don't know how this is happening, somehow these large corporate interests due to a conflagration of factors that have come together are being prevented in some instances from being able to wield the power of our democratic institutions as a mechanism to engender their profit. Now, I'm not saying that they're losing every battle, but the very fact that they're losing any battle at, better, battle at, all. at all is very yeah. unique. I mean, yes, Ida Tarbell sort of somewhat put a stop to what J.D. Rockefeller was doing, and there was the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890 and Teddy Roosevelt's presidency and whatnot. But really, this is a unique phenomena in the history of the American experiment. And in that context, um, we did have a question. Uh, I asked folks uh, ahead of time if they wanted to ask you some questions. So that was my introduction to this next question, which comes okay. from at Shire underscore CT on Twitter, who's great to follow for news about cannabis policy Connecticut. in Connecticut. How can we break MSO influence over state governments and regulatory bodies? And what steps should grassroots cannabis advocates take to educate cannabis users about the dangers of MSO tactics and influence? Oh boy, it's so, uh, it's hard, I think. Um, I think education is important. Right, so like we're since people like you and I, Grant and and Shire, I'm sure are are really not to, not to use a bad pun, but we're in the weeds. Like we're deep into this thing, and I think that it's hard to get the average person to really pick up the finer points of what's going on and why it's so unjust. Um, but if you can get someone here, there are certain things that you can talk about that are always, that always make sense, right? So I think one of the things I always try to highlight is how important it is for home grow. That life is like something that leaves my lips like a thousand times a day. And I, I think talk about how it's important to equity because it is the first step that just allows everyone access to touch this plant and like figure out what's going on about it with it and at, try it, try their hand at growing. Like you couldn't, how could you create a small business that is about growing cannabis if you never were able to touch or grow the cannabis yourself or see the seeds or, or see how it grows or anything like that. Um, uh, and, like visibility is super important. I think that uh, if you have the ability, not everybody has this ability because of uh, where they work or, or some of the consequences that they might face or where they live maybe. But if you can be open about cannabis use, I think that you should be. It shouldn't be something that you hide. You should at least be open as open about it as you are with your alcohol consumption or, or something similar to that effect where if you're going to, if you're willing to, you know, post a picture of yourself on social media with talking about happy hour and kicking back with a glass of wine, whatever, consider posting a picture of yourself smoking that joint because the more stigma works against, works against us in myriad ways. Um, when we talk about these uh, towns not allowing cannabis businesses, that's, that's all stigma. Um, when we talk about uh, um, the, the, uh, any kind of over-regulation um, that, that ends up putting small businesses out of business and things like that, 
It's all based on the idea of safety from a dangerous substance, but cannabis is not a dangerous substance. Um, it is a therapeutic substance. Uh, it's like aloe or something, right? Aloe is a therapeutic substance. You keep it in your house. It kind of has spikes on it. I mean, should it be illegal? I mean, you could bite and eat and consume a ton of aloe and like poison yourself. But with every, people keep an aloe plant in their kitchen because if you get burned, you can like, you know what I'm saying? There's no stigma against aloe. Um, if you show a, uh, a person in a movie, this is the stuff I, I try to talk about too a lot, is like when you show depictions of cannabis use, the jokes people make when they talk about, um, you know, dumb stoner is always late, dumb stoner can't understand something, whatever it is. Know that that is the same, derived from the same history when people talk about lazy Mexicans or something like that. That comes from the same thing. It's the same, you're saying the same thing. Um, and because, because when, when people started calling, making up these stereotypes, they were saying Mexicans were smoking cannabis. It was making them lazy, blah, 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 blah. All this nonsense that we think of, you know, we, we look at now and think of it as nonsense, but it's per, still pervasive in our culture. Well, and are you saying it parlays itself into the way our lawmakers and regulators then think about policy? And converse, Absolutely. conversely, when there's cogent public discourse, and I'll tell you a very interesting fact in a second here about some work I did at one point in a prior life before I fell disabled. Um, but when there's cogent discourse surrounding the issue of cannabis, all of a sudden lawmakers and regulators are thinking about the issue in a way where they feel held accountable. So it's almost like the accuracy of what we talk about in the public sphere, whether we abdicate that duty or actually live up to that standard of being informed in the public realm, dictates the, whether or not we get valid and good laws or laws that benefit giant corporations. Now, the reason I say I'll tell you something interesting is before I fell disabled, I was actually uh, a graduate student developing a quantitative methodology to examine the cogency of public discourse as an indicator of political legitimacy within, you know, democratic republics. And the reason I, it's so fascinating to me for, to be involved in activism as I am is I get to see firsthand the, con the converse relationship so the opposite of inverse, the direct correlation between how accurate and informed the level of public discourse is and then what our lawmakers and regulators end up doing. And the most fascinating part is that the unifying theme of almost all that discourse when it's informed always seems to come back to what are corporate operators trying to do to centralize market control and eliminate competition to benefit their themselves? And then um, on the conversely, um, what are the activists trying to convey about how those smaller companies and those companies who are owned by people that were harmed by the drug war can benefit and how can consumers benefit when there's more access to the market? It, um, it seems like that's the pervasive theme of every discussion. And the saddest part I know that in the adult use arena, it's, there's a lot of money at stake, billion, hundreds of billions of dollars over the next few decades, trillions even. But yeah. the thing that really gets to me is when that corporate attitude rears its head in the medical arena. And we saw it last summer here in Massachusetts, they were gonna raise the number of patients that um, non uh, pro bono caregivers can grow for. In Massachusetts, it's, mm -hmm. if you're a medical caregiver, you can grow for patients and then charge them only for the cost that went into the grow. Now you can okay. set your cost, so there's no like set limit, but you're not supposed to mm -hmm. profit. Now they were gonna sure. increase that limit from one patient to five patients. And some of these front groups came out and tried to oppose that increase because it would mean dispensaries would be, you know, have less access to, to a consumer base. That, that really gets me. And the reason why I bring this up is I said there was some questions and there was another question from someone on Twitter, uh, Ed McNamara. John Fetterman in Pennsylvania said that uh, there's a situation where, um, uh, excuse me, Ed McNamara said, 
How do we take down John Fetterman's white guy cartel in Pennsylvania and spread wealth to those harmed, I imagine, by the drug war instead? So you live in Philadelphia. Um, what can you tell me about what has happened in Pennsylvania and is the system taken over by a group of white people who are not willing to share wealth with those harmed by the drug war? Oh, most definitely. Um, you know, I think uh, John Fetterman gets a lot of uh, attention because he is um, this guy that's out there running for U.S. Senator and he often talks about we should legalize cannabis. Ostensibly, all the activists would get behind that because that's a obviously at the forefront of what we're trying to do here. But uh, he's also showing up at, um, you know, uh, MSO dispensary opening, um, often talking about talking about how much money that the the Pennsylvania medical program has made. Um, very rarely ever addressing the needs of the patient, um, home grow, any of these things. Um, so the, I think the, uh, the patients are fed up. Uh, they don't, they, I mean, you might get like the people that don't really smoke cannabis to get behind you on that, but that's not, that those people aren't the ones sharing your message across to the other cannabis users and, and, and spreading how great you are, they're not going to do that because the, the patients are, are sick and tired of the medical program. They hate it. You know, they, we've been sitting around now for many years and they say things like, oh, it's going to get better as more operators come on board. And we've seen now many new operators come on board. When I, start, when I came in, there was only five operators. Now there's like 22 and we've seen prices go up. And we've seen, we haven't seen all that much choice. I mean, there's still like very, not that much flour available for people. Do you have home grow? Um, we don't have home oh grow. God. So I don't know if you know this, but in Massachusetts, medical patients just got expanded home grow. For a while, we were only allowed to grow the same as adult use, which is if you add one adult over 21 in your home, you could grow six plants. If you had two, uh. two adults or more, you could grow up to 12 plants. Medical right. patients now, just by having my medical card, I can grow 12 uh, flowering plants and 12 vegging plants and have unlimited clones, and I can apply for the ability to grow more. Dude, that's everything. That's it all. Um, yeah, I mean, like, these things have been, like, basic tenants. You know, John Fetterman... He's oh, sorry. Before, before we go on, I have to give credit to Shaleen Title because her working group last year in the summer, Commissioner Shaleen, former Commissioner Shaleen Title, was uh -huh. in charge of the rewrite of all of the medical rules. Each commissioner did a different thing. Commissioner Britta McBride did the delivery rules, etc. And uh, huge credit to Shaleen Title and all the commissioners for voting to allow medical patients to have those expanded uh, grow rights. But sorry, you were saying uh, about Pennsylvania. Oh, uh, yeah. The, um you know, I think that uh, if, if I'm actually meeting tomorrow with a, or this week sometime with uh, somebody from the Fetterman team, um, and I would ju I'm just going to try to keep talking to them about how important. So everybody's got their eye on this guy. He's kind of like a little PA celebrity, kind of mainstream, and how much benefit there, and he wants to legalize cannabis, and he's going to he. he He's running for U.S. Senator, so he actually can't do anything for PA right now. He's technically the lieutenant governor, but all he can really do is talk, is speak words that would help the cause. The bully, and that, the bully pulpit, as T.R. used to say? Yes, he's got it. That's the thing that he can use to help cannabis patients and, and, and people in Pennsylvania. And we're not seeing him do it. We're not seeing him say the things. So that's why the, 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 the medical patient community and the activist community is not thrilled with, with John Fetterman. He keeps getting a ton of press about cannabis, but we're waiting. He hasn't, I call him a cheerleader who doesn't really know the cheers. And so, but I actually think that he's got a lot of momentum behind him. So if we can teach him the, the cheers and give him I mean, he's this guy that talks all, a lot about working class people and he comes from a working class town and is all about the working class. 
he has to understand how much this type of legalization is harming the working class. Well, I don't true, think that he does. Yep, I was going to say the true litmus test is always when policy, when it becomes a question of policy, when it becomes a question of taking a public stand on an issue that might hurt some of these large corporations you want donations from, when the chips are down, how do you stand? Are you going to support home grow? It's one thing if you don't know about the issue, but it's another when you're asked to take a stand. And so I know part of you know the job that, that folks like yourself are doing and others is getting these politicians to get these to getting these issues on the radar of these politicians, forcing them to take stands on it. <coughs> um, one more issue I want to get your opinion on. Um, question comes from Jonathan Hammond on Twitter. And I think it's relevant, he's asking about Mississippi, but I think it's relevant to what's been happening in Florida as well. Um, what can the people of Mississippi or Florida do um, in light of what's been happening to some medical and adult use ballots that were approved or supposed to be approved by voters, but are now either getting struck down or taken off the ballot? Um, is it a matter of better uh, leadership writing the ballot initiatives? Is it a political question? What's happening in these states? I see, so I'm uh, not super well versed in these states because I've been super focused on the Northeast so much. Um, so I'm seeing, well, but what we're seeing though is that people are voting for, this is Missouri, I believe, right? Where people voted for medical cannabis and the state Supreme Court says, bang, bang, no. That's kind of like unprecedented right now. So like, I would imagine that the places where you can go there are to to your hardcore activist stuff. So I spoke with when I was speaking with uh, Shirley from from Massachusetts, uh, from Maine. I'm sorry. One of the things they did was they so one of the politicians there was you know really focusing on corporate what corporations needed, etc. They needed to shame him. They he's like there was only six of us. But we stood out in front of the house and, and had tickets and recording, and we put pressure on this guy and got him mad enough to come out of his house and be like, leave me alone or some, something like that. And he's like, and other politicians didn't want us showing up at their house. And he's like, and there was only six of us. So, like, uh, his point was like, it takes all kinds. Yeah. So, like, you know, there's, we, we need people that can show up in the halls of, con uh, of state Congress and wear your tie, um, get the garabi ties that, that, that donors don't often get because they are considered lazy and stupid and things like that. But at the same time, and I think, I think uh, this gets missed, is that you kind of need also those people that are willing to go show up at someone's house to see online trolls that are willing to follow everybody on Twitter and, and every time they say anything, know it and, and alert the rest of the community. I mean, like, these things are, are important. Not and that I we know like, anyone like that. Yeah, no. <laughs> but I think they're important. And I see these types, the people speaking out on, uh, like, say, something like a uh, Pittsburgh Normal Message Board yeah. or something like that are, are, are actually getting blocked by the group or being a, you know, rabble rousers or, or uh, wet blankets or something like that. And, um, you know, the people, you got to listen to the people, the trolls, I think. I, I, I was thinking about doing a comic about this, uh, about how, you know, they, you know, they, the trolls get, get like a really bad name and certain trolls, obviously awful. We're talking stuff like Gamergate and, and, and you know, organized kind of just terrorism basically online but the skills of public pranking online uh, online uh shaming people big deal it it, it does make a difference and it's, it's like a that it's like a modern form of taking edward bernays's propaganda and weaponizing it against the corporations yeah I mean, and it's something that anybody can do. People don't have a voice. People are, are patients in Pennsylvania are like mad as hell and they don't have a voice. And this is something that gives them a voice. Uh, and, uh, and 
we need people out there doing it. We need it all. We need every aspect of it. We need people in the in in with the politicians. We need people making phone calls on the grassroots level. You need like everybody, all hands on deck, and and everything that anybody can do. And not everybody can do everything. Not everybody can show. But people have a lot of kids and like whatever. Like you can't always show up at every everything all the time. But what? If you can apply what you can, when you can, you're healthy. It's a big help. Well, as, a, dis as a disabled person, I can attest to it firsthand. Um, you know, I'm uh, in, you know, always trying to look for ways to improve my physical health and do more and more, but my body some days doesn't cooperate. And so when I'm stuck in the house, I can still participate in our democracy because of the fact that we live in this world where we have a digital arena where people can do that. Now, yes, it gets taken advantage of, and it falls to all of us to make sure that the people who abuse that space, especially people who engage in hateful or racist or bigoted behavior, are held accountable. But for, by the same token, when we make sure that those forces are not you know, operating, we then have the ability to see the benefit that this digital world can provide to the people who are disabled, or maybe to people who don't have the time to drive to a state house for a legislative hearing. Now, I know we were gonna only go till one, but I wanna beg of you to borrow a few more minutes because I really think the issue in Maine is important and we covered so many other states we didn't get to Maine. Mm -hmm. So we, taught, we touched on Maine a little bit. We talked about how it's another example of how corporations tried to do something terrible and somehow the power of democracy won out on a bipartisan basis. But let's dive into this a little bit. In Maine, the, um, there's a, now there's, the word of the past couple of years has been regulatory capture. And it's kind of been a theme of our discussion today, which is that um, regulatory capture is this process whereby a regulatory agency, like the Cannabis Control Commission in Massachusetts or the Office of Marijuana Policy in Maine, gets taken over by the interest it's supposed to be regulated. Now, as a result of that, it can lead to these terrible rules with high barriers to entry that cause an oligopoly. So now um, in Maine, there was a situation where the Office of Marijuana Policy wanted to roll out some new rules for the state's 3,000 strong existing network of medical caregivers. These are small mom and pop operations. They employ you know, a total of 5,000 people across all 3,000 businesses, but they make um, a decent amount of money. It's Maine's largest agricultural crop and it sustains a bunch of small uh, businesses that help families put food on the table. Now these rules, according to advocates, would have shut down 80% of those 3,000 caregivers. So what did advocates do? They went to the state house in Augusta, they filed bill LD1319 and LD1242, and they got the legislature itself with veto-proof majorities. Rem remember, the OMP is an agency that works for Maine's governor, Susan Mills, so if the legislature passed this bill to stop the rules that her agency was doing, she could just veto it. So they had to pass it with 66% or more support in both houses, and they did that. So, so, so it's an example of what you have to do sometimes to break down this influence, but at the same time, when, when small caregivers can win that kind of battle, it's very impressive. And also, before I ask you the question, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention that, Dawson Julia, who opened the first medical caregiver store in Maine and was fighting the ch leading the charge against the implementation of these new rules, with a month to go before the crucial votes happened, he was seriously injured in a moped accident while on his first vacation in three years. And the Maine community deserves so much credit. Uh, Susan Meehan, uh, Lori, um, Cynthia, uh, I'm sure uh, Samantha Brown, so many people came together and in Dawson's honor, took up what he, the charge, and led that fight and led it to fruition and won. So I guess the question on all of that is, as much as we've talked about how corporations are dominating the system, what do these victories over the past few days in Connecticut and Maine say about where we're going in the future? Is it really the case that small groups of well-meaning people can use our democratic process to stop these big companies? I think it's, I think, uh, it's, a, it's a snowball building in a way, because with each of these victories, we can now point to these victories. 
Now, we can point to Maine and say, look what these people did in Maine. And it helps. That knowledge is important. And we can spread that to politicians. And they're getting more and more knowledgeable about how things are going on. You know, you talk to uh, almost any state politician in Pennsylvania about cannabis that's a Democrat, they're going to be like, we need home grow, but the Republicans won't let us do it. You know, but they're talking about home grow because they know that that's important for patients. Um, and so, like, the more stuff like that's Austin awesome, Julia story, by the way. Uh, from what I understand, that I don't, I don't know if the victory would have been that substantial if that didn't happen to Doc, because that's the focal point that everybody rallied around. There was like three or four disparate groups and kind of this is like the problem with all all groups, small groups, there's always this infighting and things like that. And so they were, because of Dawson, they were able to put everything aside and everybody banded together, all 3,000 of those, those businesses. That is the one thing I think that other states don't really have. That like in Mass, in Vermont, Right, there's groups of people, the Vermont Growers Association. Now that's potential small businesses, people that want to be a small business, but in Maine they're already small businesses. So this literally was. It, it's very motivating when your legitimate business is about to get put under by a, by a, a, a law like this. So you know that gives Maine, Mainers a big advantage. All those small businesses already existing, already having stakes in the game, some for a decade, you know what I mean, uh, for a long time. You know, that's a, that's a big motivator. Um, what we've got to do in states that don't have small businesses like that is motivate patients and motivate the people who want to be in that small business. And it's hard to get potential small business owners excited about starting a small business when they literally legally cannot do it. <laughs> like, and it, it, so it's hard to, to get to get the small business community, the potential small business community, to rally compared to an already thriving small business community to rally. Um, so, but you know that victory in Maine. I hope that. It spread. I think that I hope people start pointing to Maine as like the place to be and the place to go to get your cannabis. Um, and they have a, a, a very generous um, uh, reciprocity program for out of state patients. Uh, technically, they're not supposed to accept CA medical cards, but a lot of places do anyway. Uh, but pretty much every other state, it's full reciprocity. Uh, and you know, it's look, it's a place where the prices of cannabis are what they should be, you know, um, where you can get high quality stuff. People are competing on quality and competing on price, like, uh, you know, this whole capitalism thing that everybody is in love with, except for when it comes to weed, they want to like, everybody is all wheeling and dealing for free market capitalism. Except we. Well, I, I don't even think it's that. I, and I don't want to keep you, but I think we it, it really exposes a latent hypocrisy within our, you know, system of finance, which is our corporations have a, appropriated the language of free market capitalism when in reality they support this sort of like state mandated oligopoly monopoly. And if, in fact, you can read Adam Smith in The Wealth of Nations, and he sounds more like Bernie Sanders today than most American corporations. And obviously, Adam Smith is the founder of laissez-faire economics. And the reason I bring that up is the discipline of free market economics works against the centralization of economic control in the hands of a few companies. It was actually a perversion, a subversion 
of the discipline of free market economics that led to where we are today. And these companies would have us believe the battle is between free market economics and socialism. Absolutely not. The battle is between these sort of oligopical, uh, monopolistic and oligopoly-driven companies and sort of free market principles. And the reality is that if the state and Teddy Roosevelt taught us this in the era of trust busting. If the state does not walk tall and carry a big stick, I think it speaks softly and carry a big stick, but I'm gonna say walk tall and carry a big stick. You cannot break and control the influence of those wealthy corporations. They have everything on their side. They have money, political connections, a system of campaign contributions that is nearly unaccountable and untraceable. The only way to hold them accountable is by wielding the power of our democratic process and beating them. You must be ruthless and just relentlessly in a very metaphorical way, use the power of the pen to break and control that influence. And what's fascinating is if you read Federalist 10 by James Madison, he says in that very discussion that our republic is always going to have a standing threat from factions. Now, he was talking at the time about kind of a different kind of faction, but the point is the same. Small groups of people will get together and try to use their influence to undermine the democratic process. And the democratic process, through well-meaning agents, has to be able to stand up and protect itself. That's really what the cannabis arena is highlighting, in my opinion. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, every time I, every time I, uh, learn, you know, the more I've dug in on cannabis, the more I see that I, I question how our political system is even a thing at this point. I mean, it's so, as far as I can see, things happen almost completely randomly and are influenced by forces that have nothing, almost nothing to do with the best interests of anyone except for the two people writing the deal um like it's insane to me like that anything at all happens because everybody everybody that i've been talking to i've talked to a bunch of new jersey politicians and i wonder how anything of note ever gets done in new jersey because it seems to be a group of people glad handing each other and paying trying to cordon off as much state funds to themselves as they possibly can, and somehow things get done. Um, it, 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 it's really been eye-opening and, 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 and kind of like, uh, you know, disillusioning, I guess. Well, I think in some sense, it, it goes back to that cogency discussion. It, it, there has to be that moment of, of, of de-alienation. You, you have to be willing to confront the fact that the, the entire political system functions as a way to advance the control of either people with a lot of money or a lot of political influence, because that's when the, you can actually start weaponizing in an allegorical way the tools of control that they're using. Because Amazing. if yeah. you weren't able to do that, it would just be a constant cycle of re-victimization. So I think right. it's central yeah. to being, the sad part is though, that confronting that demon requires staring into this abyss of just like conflicts of interest and, you know, just hidden behavior and, you know, two-faced sort of manipulation. And you have to stare at it all the time and then it starts <laughs> to stare back. And it's very, fr it's very scary. Yeah, it does. It wears on you after a while. I think. You know, one of the things uh, the activist community is like, we all support each other in that way because everybody, you know, in the comics community, we do things like this because <laughs> comics, uh, you know, is always on the short end of the stick. It's hard to make a living. It's time consuming and uh, people don't respect it as a medium. This whole thing that cartoonists go through, you know. Um, and uh, you got to support each other because at some point, everybody is you got, got to get tossed off the ledge because you're like, what the hell am I doing this for? And so it's important, I think, for activists to support each other in that way and just, you know, share your successes if you're feeling good and, um, you know, remind your other activist friends that they're doing good work and they've made a difference because it, sometimes, it, you know, it can feel like you're not and it can feel, 
you know, uh, hopeless. It can, and in those moments, um, I do encourage people to, to look, uh, like you were saying, to, to your colleagues and to develop those networks because even in one state you, where you may be experiencing a, you know, a bunch of losses, there may be other states where people are winning uh, small victories, big victories, and you might be able to, to pick up some tactics and start applying it. I've seen this um, happening in Michigan right now where there was sort of this kind of unopposed sort of steamroll towards a, a corporate back takeover of the medical program that would, would have destroyed a lot of the caregivers there. And now all of a sudden um, they're picking up steam on a boycott of those corporate operators. They're getting yep. national attention on the issue. And I think that speaks to the fact that there is this support network ready to deploy at a moment's network. And the more people in the cannabis activist community who are in it for authentic reasons can realize that and take advantage of that network, the easier it is to stop these corporate forces. Yeah, I mean, I think that that was a big deal at Michigan thing because a lot of those companies were California companies. And the people in California, I love my California readers and I love California in general. I love California weed. Uh, but they've had it very good in California for a long time. And um, I, I think sometimes it's hard for Californians to uh, like understand actually what's going on here. Like, you know, they'll say like, oh, it's federal legalization's around the corner. You know, it's gonna be like this everywhere soon. Whereas here, there's not as much optimism in that regard. Uh, and so I'm not sure where I was going with the California thing, but it's, but, uh, it's easy to you, I think you might have been saying it's easy for them to disengage. Whereas these California companies were then going right. to Michigan. Exactly. That's a, sorry. Yes. That was the point. When that stuff came out, my California readers were like, Oh my God. They're like, I know who that is. I know that brand. I know who that is. They're all over California. And so it's like, Cal, and it's weird the way, the, because of the way the state laws have shaken out, there's like um, twin twin uh, states. Where, so like you see Michigan is getting a lot of California, Michigan, You're getting a lot of California, Michigan, and then some California, Maine, California, Maine, Michigan. But then you never, you very rarely, or then it'll be, or it'll be like Michigan, Colorado, California, Colorado, Michigan. You're talking about companies choosing where to operate or not the necessarily yeah. the regulations aligning the companies. Yeah, but it's like they, where they're similar. So you don't see a lot of California companies getting into Massachusetts, let's say, or New Jersey or Pennsylvania because it's a completely restrictive market. Like it's too, they already License have that. Caps. Yeah. So, but you are seeing them jump in where they can jump in. And that's in places like Michigan and Maine, Oklahoma. So there's like two kinds of MSOs. There's like this East Coast MSO that has like this whole Florida. This very medical. Yeah. It's like this really hardcore medical situation. And then there's the California style MSO, as I like to call it. That's California, Michigan, Colorado, Maine, sometimes in Maine, sometimes Oklahoma, you know, sometimes Oregon, sometimes uh, Washington. Why State. does Oklahoma have 554 dispensaries or something, by the way? Because uh, because Oklahoma kind of did the thing like Maine, where they the first met the first year, it was only open to small businesses, so everybody jumped in. And it was and it was cheap. It was like five thousand dollars for a license or something like that, and easy to start. And so you saw everybody jump up. So there was more dispensaries in Tulsa than Boston on by a mile, I'm sure. Um, but, uh, and you're you, saying so these Colorado style MSOs saw states like Maine, Oklahoma, Michigan a little bit as an opportunity to get a foothold without the Massachusetts sort of oversight. Yeah, they're able to get into another state, move, set up larger footholds, because they're they're already competing in a competitive state in, in California. It's like there's a, a competitive the MSO that's actually trying to compete as a large company creating a good quality product, and then there's the MSO on the East Coast that's not actually trying to compete, but just gain exclusive territory. 
through, they're trying to compete through regula regulation through regulatory and legislative lobbying. And legislative. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to get into. I, I can't believe I kept you. I want to get into two very quick things. One is I want to get you to loop back. So you were going to tell me about the Michigan boycott and why it was so um, important that um, California readers and nationwide people were saying, wow, these companies in Michigan are attacking caregivers. That's wrong. Yeah, because I think that uh, there's there's less of a, uh, a problem with corporations in, in California. So they're just they, seeing because they had kind of organic growth. You know, they started small. The brand got more popular. It grew bigger in kind of like an organic way, in a similar way to we see other businesses grow and get bigger. And expanding to another state like that is would be a natural extension of, of free market, right? But what we're seeing, so they don't see that as bad. But when they get there to that new state, and they immediately start trying to uh, punish local caregivers. And you're, they're noticing that, that local Michigan people are starting a boycott against them. That means that there's, those, that allows California people to get it a little bit, to be like, oh, this is why, you know, these companies are, because they're not doing the same things in California. I mean, they're, they're consolidating in California, and I'm sure they're lobbying. Um, in California as well, big time, but it's not the same kind of fight that we're having right now. Whereas, where it's you know, they're keeping people out of out of the business entirely. Um, you know, they're they're just they're competing and they're growing and they're expanding in in a not quite as ruthless way. But when they get to a certain size, the ruthlessness comes out. Well, and you're, I think what you're also keying in here is that it's almost like they think, well, we're going to go make these policy attacks. For example, Cure Relief was driving a lot of the attacks on the caregivers in Maine, trying to uh, oppose caregivers being able to grow 60 plants instead of 30, right. trying to oppose caregivers being able to operate in five business collectives, trying to oppose passing LD1242 and stopping the rule changes. They think, oh, well, we don't, we're either an MSO without a home base or we're going to a state where we're not centered, you know, where we don't, where our home base isn't located. No one, you know, we can just engage in this lobbying, you know, we're going to take some heat from it. But at the end of the day, people are still going to go to our stores. And that's the real danger, in my opinion. And it's also why I think a new kind of boycott is forming. You're never going to impact the bottom lines of these companies. And they know that. But what terrifies them is... Um, being a pariah, not being allowed to go to industry events, basically not being allowed to take part in cups. And that's happening. It happened in Massachusetts to this day. Terptown Throwdown, the Harvest Cup, NECAN, CDA members cannot, and their subsidiary brands cannot go to those events. They cannot enter those cups because of it that choice. Brand. Like it's brand. They're, the only thing that, that they're listening to is when you hurt their brand. When they, you can associate their brand with evil stuff, that's when they start changing the tune. But did you know we had a retailer in, you are not, and I, I, I keep saying this, but it's too fascinating. We had a retailer <laughs> in Massachusetts, Cambridge, the city where Harvard and MIT is, passed an ordinance. Remember I told you one of the biggest issues here was, here was local cities and towns were not taking equity into consideration? Well, Cambridge creates an ordinance saying that for two years, only economic empowerment applicants can open the dispensary. What happens? A medical dispensary called Revolutionary Clinic sues. And their argument, they say to a judge that that kind of priority period would be racially discriminatory, ostensibly against a white-owned medical dispensary. They actually came out and said that in a motion for summary judgment. And that, I think, is the reality here. And I'm not saying this is any one company, but there's clearly, clearly an attempt to weaponize public relations and propaganda to do exactly what you said, to sort of differentiate the company's brand from its lobbying and regulatory behavior. And so yep. when you can link that behavior and expose it for what it is and pull back the curtain, 
all of a sudden you see the reality behind a lot of the decision making and then only then can you actively make good public policy in my opinion mm -hmm. and you see it all i mean it's obvious i mean like there's you look at there's this guy in in uh, new jersey he's uh he's uh actually the the majority whip in the in the new jersey state assembly and he owns an interest in a number of cannabis dispensaries in in a lot of a few different states I actually i'm not sure exactly because he he has like a, a public resume out there and whenever i ask him about it he's like no no that, i don't own that anymore I, i'm somewhere else now and so i i had to get i had to get this guy on texting with him on a sunday trying to get him to just tell me what he owns and where he works and he's like I've been open about everything. Well, I'm like, well, tell me now. What what are you involved in? And he and he doesn't. He hardly even like know what he's involved in. Well, I highly um, doubt he hardly knows. My guess is he's. I mean, he does. No, I'm I'm only speculating. Or let me actually do it this way. Hypothetically, someone engaged in behavior like that may do something like own a litany of holding companies inside of holding companies to a. That's that's what I was getting to. Yeah. yeah so there, it's like. Yes, so it's like I'm here, but we I'm investment in here, and that owns this and this and this and that. So it's like all this stuff that's clearly there. I mean, this is done probably across the board in every organization, but it's clearly there to obfuscate where you know where you're at, you know, and hide uh, your investment. And so you know, uh, this is the stuff. This is all. The dumb crap. Like this is why we can't have nice things. This is why we well, can't it, get hash rosin. <laughs> well, but is it is is it the case that we have to earn our republic? Um, someone said to me the first ever interview I did when I was getting involved with cannabis activism was um, of a senator named Patricia Jalen, who was on the Compromise Committee in 2017 that updated the voter approved law in Massachusetts to legalize adult use cannabis, and I said. Senator Jalen, you know, it's great that, you know, you fought to keep the voter approved law as close to the text as you could, but how do we make sure that what gets implemented actually reflects the will of the voters? And she said back, it, um, eternal vigilance is the price of democracy. And is that the case? Are we, are we, are we commanded or, or is there a duty on behalf of citizens to ensure the integrity of the democratic process? And if the answer is yes, does that mean if a majority of the people or 90% of the people abdicate that duty, then we consent implicitly to giving away the Republic to those corporations? I think that it's, it, it, it is beholden on the citizen to do something, but it's not just the citizen's job. You're, you're voting for people and essentially giving them a job and you have there's a sense that that person is going to do the job you're you can't be there making every decision for them you're electing them to represent you and so if they're saying cause i've had i've heard representatives in pennsylvania say to activists hey why didn't you tell me about this last week uh i would have voted differently maybe i just didn't know where were you? Get on that. And it's like, dude, you're, if this is actually your job that you're getting paid for, I am just a guy. You know what I mean? I don't even, I have so many other things going on in my life. This is just one aspect of one thing. You can't expect every citizen, it, it, they could, it, you can't, the, the politician can't abdicate their own duty because the citizenry isn't screaming at them enough. I mean, I don't think that's a fair assessment. That means that the politician, the legislator is always going to do the wrong thing unless there's a group of people yelling at them to do the right thing. You know, you're voting for these people to make decisions. You want them to make decisions. And so if they're on their own making bad decisions and can't make a good decision unless you're badgering them, they're maybe not the right person for that. Well, that is a defense of republicanism of which I'm sure um, many of its critics and proponents would be proud.
because I think that, you know, you address kind of the core issue, which is that, yes, there is a duty of the citizenry to be informed, but it, the citizenry is in turn paying for these individuals to perform a public service, and part of that public service is to be informed. So I, I think you right. highlight the key. But at the, at the end of the day, it is a recursive argument because the citizenry is the check and balance. And unfortunately, yeah. we've seen in the modern age, the farther removed our lawmakers are from what their citizens are talking about, the easier it is for, for things to go haywire. But, you know, um, I also want to say I've taken you 30 minutes over time. So, um, but it has been, I think, a conversation that I hope folks who have been listening have benefited from. I have learned a lot from this conversation, so I'm really grateful. Um, hey. Before I sign off and, and tell folks where to find more information, I want to give you a chance to close and tell folks where they can find more information about you and your amazing work. Uh, so, I'm on Twitter and Instagram, at Fox Brown. Um, my comic, Legalization Nation, uh, comes out that's twice a week on Twitter and Instagram. I also have a Patreon, uh, Legalization Nation Patreon. Um, all the comics are free, uh, but the Patreon is for if you read what you, like what you read and would like to support, uh, help keep stuff free. Well, thank you so much. I can say that I'm an avid reader myself of the Legalization Nation comic and. Brian's um, artistic sk skills are paralleled only by his insightful, informed, and cogent commentary. You will find, if you do follow his work, um, that each comic strip not only depicts um, a discussion with someone who's right at the center of an issue, but it's an authentic person. He does not go around interviewing corporate stooges and letting them spew astroturf, and if he does, interview someone who is on the opposite side of an issue the questions are tough but fair and he does give them a chance so um although i will say he he's very good at uh, finding that one or two sentence sort of uh, uh, hypocrisy in the answer and highlighting it which is a, yeah. cre a credit to his artistic talent that's why you, that's that's the benefit of being the cartoonist <laughs> So, um, again, uh, Brian, on behalf of MassCan, the Massachusetts Cannabis Reform Coalition, and our virtual education village, this has been our 22nd panel. Thank you for being our guest today and giving us over 90 minutes of your time. This has been, as I said, an extremely uh, edifying and enjoyable experience. I hope folks uh, who watched the replay got a chance to get something out of this, as well as folks who watched it live. I would be remiss if I did not say uh, that this was presented by MassCan. I am Grant Smith Ellis, the president of MassCan. We are a 501c4 cannabis nonprofit. You can find out more and donate to the organization if you'd like to support our mission at masscan.org. You can follow us on Facebook at MassCan, Instagram masscan.org, and Twitter at MassCan. Now, if you want to follow me, my name is Grant Smith Ellis. You can find me on Twitter. You can also find me on grantsmithellis.com. And I too have a Patreon. On, although, as with Brian, all of my work is free and I only accept patron, patrons to help keep it free. And I hope that becomes a trend, Brian. Uh, maybe we'll be trendsetters. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> signing off from MassCan, uh, our Ed Village, thank you again for everyone who joined us and to Brian. And I hope you all enjoy your afternoon. <laughs>